Okay. Good morning, everyone, and happy Wednesday to you all. And I'd like to start with some recap questions so that we can uh, get going where we left off last time. So let's have a little bit of a conversation this morning. Okay, what are some nutritional and physiological roles of proteins in food? Okay, I'm going to sit, relax, and wait for you to say something. Okay, Lauren. Perfect. That's awesome. So, what about some physical roles of proteins? You said browning, that's a physical role, that's color. Um, so, water absorption, that is physical. There are other physical uh, characteristics. We talked about, Emily? Uh, generation. Yeah. Yeah, the functionality that results in structural. Uh, characteristics, dilation, emulsification, foaming. Um, another could be the flavor. We talked about aspartame, for example, is a dipeptide of aspartic acid and phenylalanine. You have, a f during aging of cheese, you have the bacterial proteases that would break down the proteins into peptides and give you that unique flavor, you have monosodium glutamate, um, the bitter peptides for hydrophobic peptides, sourness for the acidic amino acids. So a lot of different physical uh, contributions of proteins to food. What are some intrinsic factors that may impact the protein structure? Do, do you guys count participation in this class? No? I'm going to tell George, Emily, and Lauren will get plus two. Who else would like to get some extra credit? Okay. The yes, so the R groups. So the R groups in amino acids, they could be different structures. Some would be charged, some have sulfide group, and we're going to talk about all the different R groups. So depending on the constituents of the R group, you will have different chemical reactions and different molecular weight, molecular uh, interactions that will contribute to structure. Um, so other than that, what else intrinsic factors? What's your name? Jennifer. Jennifer. Remember names. Okay. Who else? This, uh, Elisa. So the source of it, so there are different sources of proteins. I saw another hand. What's your name? Loma. Loma, yes, that's right. The contribution of tertiary primary amino acids. Tertiary structure of the protein, the conformation of the protein. And we'll talk about different conformation of proteins and how they impact structure and function. Tiffany. The hydrophobicity of the protein, Walter. The net charge, perfect. So a lot of intrinsic factor, amino acid composition, the sequence, the charge, the hydrophobicity, um, the R group. So all of these different intrinsic factors. Okay, I'm, I'm making a mental memory of who's answering questions. Okay, cool. What are some extrinsic factors that impact the protein? Your name, please. The, the, what's that? The pH, yes. Cervantes, Cervant, right? Oh. Yes. <laughs> I know her. <laughs> you know her. <laughs> what did you say? Temperature. Temperature, of course. So pH, temperature, Molly. Yes, the conditions of storage. Emma. Protein modification. Your name, please. Sabrina. Presence of, enzymes. Presence of enzymes modification. Your name, please. The extraction solvent. Yes, if we are extracting 
oil from soybean to, to purify protein, hexane might impact the protein structure. You guys are great, yes. George's gonna be not happy with me, but I'm gonna vote for plus two for all of you. Um, excellent. So, let's keep going. All right, here's where we left off, introducing the structure of amino acids. That was the last slide. I'm gonna, just a quick refresher. So we have an amine group. Uh, so it's the basic component. The amine group is the group that would like to hold on to the proton, whereas the acidic group, the carboxyl group, would like to give proton. And given that you have basic and acidic, that makes the amino acid and hence the protein a buffer resist change in pH. And then we talked about, that was the last thing we talked about, the R group and how the R group differs in polarity, hydrophobicity, um, different functional groups that may be involved in different reactions and molecular interactions and hence the functionality of the protein. So, we said that the, uh, in nature we have L configuration where the amine group is on the left. However, you can find D configuration, but that is mostly due to presence of bacterial fermentation. So, um, or if you have heat and alkali treatment, sometimes you get D amino acids as well, where the amine group is now on the right. And we call this racemization. Re um, that means you would have a mixture of L and D configuration as such. So the amine group here is to, your, to the right, uh, to the right of the carbonyl carbon, or to the left of the carbonyl, um, the uh, chiral carbon, sorry, not the carbonyl carbon, the chiral carbon, either to the left of it or to the right of it. So you, that would call it stereochemically different the, for the um, location of the amine group. Um, like I said, it's heat and alkali treatment and microorganisms in such as in fermented foods and beverages uh, originating mostly from bacteria. Okay, you need to know the different essential amino acids versus non-essential amino acids. And probably most of you know by now what essential amino acids are those that are not produced in the body and required to be consumed in the diet, whereas non-essential can be synthesized mainly by transamination or amination um, of keto acids. So the essential amino acids are usually eight amino acids, those that are in red, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, thionine, tryptophan, and valine. So you want to know these, okay? So you need to know your essential amino acids. Now histidine is somewhat essential because it's required for children. Children are unable to synthesize um, histidine in their body. Adults do. That's why it is partial. So some people say we have nine essential amino acids if you want to include all the population, children and adult. And if you're just talking about adult population, you can say eight essential amino acids. There are the semi-essential, the cysteine and tyrosine. There are semi because cysteine can be partially produced from methionine. So if you're consuming methionine and the diet is low in cysteine, the body can um, produce cysteine, but if you don't consume methionine, then be de by default you might have deficiency in cysteine. And the same with tyrosine. Tyrosine is produced from phenylalanine. The same situation. If your diet is low in phenylalanine, then you will have low tyrosine as well. And the rest of the amino acids are non-essential amino acids. Okay, so you want to have a general idea, not necessarily memorize the structures, but at least the general idea of how the different amino acids uh, vary. So we have amino acids that are nonpolar, and we have polar amino acids. So you want to 
categorize your amino acids and know them. This is polar, this is nonpolar, this is aromatic, having a ring structure versus non-aromatic. So I, I do not expect you or I don't think George will expect you to, to know how to draw uh, the amino acids, but at least to know that tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine are nonpolar aromatic amino acids. They have an uh, aromatic structure in their R group, which gives them a characteristic uh, that is absorption of UV light. So being aromatic, the protein, usually any protein, will have a certain amount of these amino acids, so proteins absorb light in the UV range because of these three amino acids. So that's what you really need to know and remember. Another characteristic for tyrosine specifically, it has a phenol group, that means a benzene ring and an OH. And this OH group is important for you to remember because in alkaline pH, this OH group ionizes, meaning it gives, out, it gives its uh, proton. So it gives the hydrogen and becomes O minus. Then it becomes a charged amino acid. Why is this important? Because when you have charged amino acid, it will impact solubility. It will enhance the solubility of the protein in general. You have more interactions with water. So oftentimes proteins are extracted from uh, like soy flour, for example, you want to extract protein to produce a protein ingredient, you would extract it with alkaline pH, 7.5 to 8.5. You're enhancing the solubility of the protein by enhancing charge load. One of it is tyrosine carrying a negative charge. Yes, Sarah? Ah, uh, speak up. You know, I'm going to try to put the, this on, but the only problem, I'm, I'm worried that the recording, you know, I record my lectures, so maybe Sophia can put it up on the Moodle if you like to listen to it again, but I don't know if it's going to interfere at all with this, um, but I'll try. Usually I project, but it seems I'm not projecting well today. Okay. Can you hear me better? Okay, I'll talk very low <laughs> voice so that don't hurt your ears. Okay. So there are some characteristics that, uh, or phenomena of different amino acids that have nutritional or biological uh, impact. So we're going to talk about several amino acids and their biological impact. So you, uh, you probably heard of phenylketonuria um, disease. So you have about 1 in 15,000 births of babies that will have this disease, that means their body cannot process or metabolize uh, phenyl, uh, poly, um, what, what do you call it, phenylalanine. So what these babies would be lacking is this very key enzyme, it's phenylalanine hydroxylase, that metabolizes the phenylalanine and break it down into components that are non-toxic and can leave uh, our body through the urine. Um, but however, if these babies don't have these in, this enzyme, what happens, you generate phenylketones. And the way we detect the presence of this disease is measuring, measuring phenylketones in the urine. So these phenylketones uh, will uh, accumulate in the body result in mental retardation and epileptic seizures and ultimately death. So these, um, these babies and eventually as they grow 
up, they sh couldn't have a diet high in uh, or have at all uh, phenylalanine, which is really, really hard. Almost all proteins, not almost, all proteins have phenylalanine to a certain extent. So these, these children and later adults will be on a very strict diet that doesn't have protein, and the only way they can get their amino acids is by getting supplements of amino acids, including uh, the phenylalanine. It's a very annoying uh, disease, really. Uh, I put here the Diet Coke because it says uh, it's a cautious for the phenylketonuria patients because it says contains phenylalanine. And why does Diet Coke contain phenylalanine? Yeah. Phenylalanine and aspartic acid. You had a question? Yes, well, again, the, that, that's in their supplemental diet, they have to have the tyrese. They have to have all amino acids except the phenylalanine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a very good question. And your name? OK. All right, tyrosine also might have a biological impact. So uh, tyrosine, if it gets oxidized in the presence of tyrosinase enzyme, you get uh, the result. Uh, result is a polymerization reaction of the oxidized tyrosine to form melanin, which are brown pigments. These brown pigments are primarily the determinant of human skin color and also the hair color. Um, but also you can form biogenic amine. The biogenic amine tyramine is formed when you have tyrosine decarboxylase enzyme where the carboxyl group is cleaved off and then you get tyramine. This happens usually during fermentation. For example, it is really high or aging. Uh, it's really high in blue cheese and if, the, if you consume a lot of blue cheese, at some point you might be sensitive to it and have headaches um, resultant of consuming high amount of tyramine. Okay, the other set of amino acids that are nonpolar, we call them the aliphatic group. Uh, the aliphatic meaning, you know, you have the aromatic and you have the aliphatic. The aliphatic is your R group does not have a ring structure. You look here and you say there is a proline. It looks like a ring structure, but it is not a ring structure. What happens is the primary amine, okay, do you know primary, secondary, and tertiary amine? Do you know what that means? Okay, who nodded their head and know what that means? You want to say what it means? No, yeah, it is not related to the protein structure, the primary amine. This is, for example, a primary amine. That means your nitrogen has a, a one bonded to carbon, one bond to carbon, and has three hydrogens. So that's a primary amine. This is a secondary amine because it has, it's bonded to two carbons, and when the amine is bonded to three carbons, carbons it becomes a tertiary amine. So this is a secondary amine, and it's a unique structure. It's not totally aliphatic, and it's not a ring structure. It's just the amine group here is bonded to the R group. So your R group, the end of the R group, which is this uh, CH2, the carbon is bonded to the nitrogen in this case. It's kind of a, clo a closed loop, closed the circle. Um, which makes it a very unique, uh, it has a very unique, on the unique effect on the structure of the protein because it's a very rigid. We're going to talk later about the mobility of the bonds, which will result from primary, primary uh, protein structure, which is just a sequence of amino acid, going into the secondary structure, 
going into the third tertiary structure. So there's a lot of bending of bonds. And when you have a structure like this, the, bonding, the bonds becomes very fixed and rigid, and then your, your structure is impacted by the rigidity of this bond. So that's why we say it's unique and it will have an impact on the secondary structure of the protein. Um, the rest are regular, um, just mostly hydrocarbons. So there's the alanine, it has CH3, one methyl group, and then here you have three, um, and then it just goes, it's just a bunch of uh, hydrocarbons with the exception of methionine that has a sulfur group. So you, you want to remember that, that methionine is a sulfur-containing amino acid. Okay, and methionine also has, uh, could, res, uh, could get converted to methionyl, which has an off-flavor characteristics. It's known as the sunlight off-flavor of milk. Why it's called the sunlight? Because it's produced under exposure to UV light and in the presence of riboflavin, then you convert methionine to methionyl, which gives you this off-flavor characteristics. So it is sensitive to oxygen and heat. In the presence of UV light, you end up getting this compound. Okay, polar amino acids. So oftentimes, some, some of you might get confused about polar and charged. So usually charged molecules are polar, but not all polar molecules are charged. So this is something to keep in mind. So we have two categories of polar amino acids. We have the uh, ones that are charged and polar, and then the amino acids that are polar but not charged. So you want to know your charged amino acids. So this is something you want to remember. So not again, not necessarily this detailed structure, but you want to know that you have three basic amino acids and two acidic amino acids in nature. The three basic amino acids are histidine, lysine, and arginine. They are basic because look at, they have extra amine groups. So here you have um, your terminal amine, which is present in everything. But in addition, this one has several uh, nitrogen in their R group, and one in particular carries charge. And this, in this case, it is a tertiary amine. It's a tertiary amine, and it carries a proton. So that's what makes it a positively charged basic amino acid, because at neutral pH, you have a plus, a minus, cancel each other, but you have a plus. So it is positively charged at neutral pH because of that extra amine group in its R chain. Okay, lysine has an additional tertiary amine, uh, sorry, primary amine. This is a primary amine and this is a primary amine. So lysine has a primary amine. Primary amine is more reactive than secondary amine and more reactive than tertiary amine. Remember that because it has three protons. So it is more reactive. Um, and arginine, it has a secondary amine that is charged. So all of these amino acids, the three of them, are basic. That means they're positively charged at neutral pH. Glutamic acid and aspartic acid, so these are the acidic, obviously. Instead of having an amine group, they have an additional carboxyl group in their R chain. So at neutral pH, these charges will cancel, then you will have a net negative charge. At neutral pH, this is negatively charged, and this is negatively charged. So glutamic acid and aspartic acid. So lysine in particular uh, is an important reactive amino acid. Not only it is an essential amino acid, it also reacts with reducing sugars during a heating process. 
resulting in Maillard reaction and browning. So browning and you, you end up uh, in a large polymer melanoidins, and these are brown colors, and also you end up with off flavors and protein polymerization, all bad negative uh, impacts sometimes. Uh, negative impact you don't want in most cases. And we call it, it's also nutritional loss because lysine get consumed in the reaction. So you lose an essential amino acid. So the more you have lysine in your protein and the more they are reducing sugar during the process, you, uh, you are uh, potentially losing on nutritional value of the product due to loss of lysine. And again, the reason that I have lysine here as an example, it's an essential amino acid first. Second, it has a primary amine in its R group. That means it's most reactive than other uh, amino acids. And the, the Maillard reaction is actually uh, a chemical reaction between the carbonyl group of a, a reducing sugar and the amine group, the primary amine group of an amino acid within a protein. Another um, amino acid in this category, which is the glutamic acid, you can generate monosodium glutamate uh, from glutamic acid. So instead of having this hydrogen, you will have a sodium. So you will end up having a monosodium uh, glutamate. So this is the fifth taste called the umami. So usually you have the sour, the bitter, the sweet, and the salt. These are the four common tastes. But then this is the fifth taste, which is the umami meat-like uh, aroma. Um, it's often added to enhance flavor and usually used in products such as frozen dehydrated or canned meat product. So you can see here, this is a canned meat spaghetti and meatball. You have the monosodium glutamate in there. Also, it's highly concentrated in soy sauce. So that's why um, when you hear the Chinese restaurant syndrome, it's associated with consuming soy sauce probably or food in general in Chinese restaurant that could have high levels of monosodium glutamate and high consumption. And some people have are hypersensitive to it and they could suffer from uh, drowsiness, headache, and stomach ache, but not everybody, so some hypersensitive people. Any questions so far? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. So the question was, does increasing uh, salt uh, with sodium chloride in a product that has glutamic acid result in this? Not necessarily, because um, usually glutamic acid is in a protein. In this case, it's a single amino acid that was reacted with the sodium to produce a monosodium glutamate under certain conditions to get that ingredient. So. No. So you, when you have salt and you have a protein and has glutamic acid, you don't necessarily get that uh, impact. But that's a very good question. Okay. So now the other, um, the last component or category is the polar that are non-charged. So these amino acids include the following. Uh, they're polar because they have some certain group that makes them a functionally polar. Uh, compound. So, for example, serine has an OH, thionine has an OH. The presence of an OH makes it a little bit more polar. Uh, glycine, why is it polar? Because look at glycine. Glycine is the only amino acid that doesn't have a chiral carbon. Look at that. Chiral carbon, if you remember, is a carbon that, ha that is bonded to four different groups. But in this case, you have a chiral car no chiral carbon because you have two hydrogen groups. Look at the R group of glycine. It's H. It's a nothing, basically. You don't have hydrocarbons. You don't have a ring structure. You have nothing. That's what makes it it's the smallest amino acid and a polar amino acid. 
Okay, so cysteine, cysteine, I'm stressing the E, I'll tell you why I'm stressing the E in a minute. It's cysteine is an amino acid that has a sulfhydryl group. SH is commonly known as a sulfhydryl group, and it's a very reactive func functional group. And it impacts a lot of the food structure. So we'll talk about that in a minute because if its ability to form disulfide linkages, and these are important in certain food applications. So it's a very important amino acid. Uh, glutamine and aspargine, so these are polar because of uh, having the uh, double bond with O and an amine group here. Uh, and these are precursors. They can be precursors to glutamic acid and aspartic acid. If you uh, add acid or alkaline with heat, they will lose an amine group. So this we call the amination. So they're going to lose an amine group and become a carboxyl group, COOH, in the presence of acid or alkaline and heat. And when they have a COOH here and no amine group, they become this one glutamic acid and this one aspartic acid. So you want to remember that glutamine in the presence of acid or base and heat, you get deamination and becomes glutamic acid. And aspartic acid, same thing. Aspar aspargine will lose an amine group in the presence of acid and alkaline and heat, and then it becomes aspartic acid. Um, here's an example where glutamine plays an important role in structure building. You know, rice bread is a common bread for gluten-free bread for people that are sensitive or allergic to gluten. So what happens is rice doesn't have the viscoelastic protein that is present in wheat. So it won't form this the strong dough that is needed for a bread to rise. So you want to do something about it. So if you add an enzyme known as transglutaminase, and you probably, when you take the enzyme lectures, you'll talk about this enzyme in particular. This enzyme, what it does, it links a glutamine with a lysine. So the amine group of lysine react with the carboxyamide group. This is the carboxyamide group right there. Carboxyamide group react with the amine group of lysine. You lose ammonia and you got a covalent bond. That covalent bond results in polymerization of one protein in rice to another protein in the rice. So when you have this polymerization, it enhances the strength of the dough, and therefore you can have a bread that rises. So let's look at serine and threonine. These are also important amino acids. So all amino acids are important. Everybody has a role. Okay, so serine and threonine ha have a hydroxyl group. They have an OH group. So what's the role of this OH group? It's a very important role in post-translational changes. You know what the term post-translational means? No? Have you heard of it at least? So when a protein is formed in a cell of a, of a living thing, whether it's plant or animal. So there is some post-translational, that means after the formation of the protein using the message in RNA. <laughs> uh, so after the protein is formed, there are some changes that could happen in the cell before the protein matures. So we call that post-translational um, changes. So Three, uh, serine and threonine both go through post-translational changes sometimes, and they can be phosphorylated or glycosylated. So because of the OH group here, the OH group is reactive, so it can react with a phosphate group, producing a phosphorylated protein, 
An example is the alpha and beta casein in milk that are phosphorylated. Um, or the OH group can react with um, sugar moiety, such as the acetyl glucosamine, and form a covalent linkages. Example here, kappa casein, again in milk, is a glycosylated protein. There are glycosylated protein in soy as well. So it's just here I'm giving you an example. Why are these proteins important? I don't know if you know how casein is soluble in milk. You know, milk is a colloidal system. I don't know if you know that or you've took that anywhere in your different courses, but milk is a colloidal system. Casein in milk is not single molecule. They are present as a micelle, a casein micelle. It's a quaternary structure of a casein. You have multiple casein molecules interacting with each other, forming a stable unit and dispersed homogeneously in milk, causing it to be a stable colloidal system. So what makes this stable colloidal system is the phosphorylated protein and the glycosylated protein. So look at this colloidal system here. I don't know now if you see my laser pointer. Okay, so see these blue dots here? We call them calcium phosphate clusters. So there, are cal there is calcium in milk, and these phosphorylated protein are going to form bridges using, with calcium, keeping these molecules together, for, forming calcium phosphate bridges. They hold on to each other. And then see this hair-like structure outside of this colloidal system right there of this micelle? This hair-like structure is your um, glycosylated portion of kappa casein. The glycosylated portion is a very hydrophilic, negatively charged portion of the protein. So if you have a set of negatively charged protein around this micelle, then it will be stable. It will be interacting with the water, and there is another micelle here. Negative charge and negative charge will repel each other. They won't interact, and then you have this very stable colloidal system. So this is an example of role of protein and also uh, the post-translational modification and the importance of serine and thionine. Okay. Let's see. Sulfider group, I told you this also is a very important protein, uh, amino acid. So the sulfider group is a very reactive group. So if you heat a protein and it's the, the pH is slightly alkaline, and then there are several protein molecules, and each of these proteins have several sulfider groups in them that are free and ready to react. In close proximity, you will have oxidation, so your presence of oxygen as well. So this sulfider group over there will react with this sulfider group. They get oxidized. They give up their hydrogen, and then uh, you end up with what we call a disulfide linkage. It's a covalent bond. This covalent bond has many roles. First, it stabilizes tertiary structure in a protein. And when we talk about tertiary structure, I'll, I'll bring that back. Uh, so I will explain it again. But it stabilizes tertiary structure, but also formation of disulfide bond has an impact during processing. And here's one example. So glycans and glutenins, proteins in a wheat. You take the flour, put water, and start your kneading process. When you're doing that, you're denaturing the glycan and glutenin and opening them up and make them more pliable, more flexible above the glass transition. They pass the glass transition. I don't know if they talked about glass transition already. Okay, so at a particular temperature and moisture content, you pass the glass transition. The protein now is pliable, moldable. So you can mold it, and then SH groups from each protein is now exposed to another SH group or several. Then you start 
forming disulfide bonds. It's one of the stabilizing molecular interactions of the gluten network. This is a gluten network right there. Okay, so this is a very important role of sulfur groups or sulfider groups, and this is one example. There are other examples we'll talk about later. Biogenic amines. So now we're done categorizing the different amino acids. Well, let, let's look at the formation of biogenic amines. Uh, that means they have uh, some biological impact or effect. So oftentimes they're produced as a bacterial metabolites originating from amino acids. And they're often used by decarboxylation, lo loss of a carboxyl group. Example, tyramine that we talked about from tyrosine. Another example is histidine. Again, if you lose the carboxyl group, um, then you end up with histamine, which is a biologically active um, amine that would result in um, headaches or um, certain sensitivity. Some people might have kind of an allergic reaction uh, because of its vasoconstrictor. Um, compound. And it could be present in spoiled meat and fish, but also in fermented foods such as the blue cheese, for example. So tuna and mackerel have high concentration of free histidine, and the histidine decarboxylase, which is an enzyme that removes the carboxyl group will result in the formation of um, histamine. And these are examples of bacteria that would, ha would carry this enzyme. And oftentimes the poisoning with histamine is called scum scumbroid, um, or is also known as histamine fish poisoning, causing headaches, flushing, um, abdominal cramps, and sometimes the allergic uh, kind of similar reaction. Another source of histamine is also blue cheese. So you can have tyramine and histamine in blue cheese. Okay, so chemical reactivity of amino acids. Oftentimes, chemical reactivity, we use it to our benefit in such a way, okay, I want to quantify amino acids. Oh, or I want to quantify the composition of a protein, the amino acid composition of a protein. So I break down the protein into singular amino acids, and then now I want to quantify the different amino acids that I have. How do I quantify them? Not every amino acid absorb light. I told you only the aromatic amino acid can be measured at UV um, 280 nanometer. What about the rest? How am I going to quantify the rest? So I look into chemical reactions that will result in a colored compound that I can measure absorption. So one example is an anhydrin. So an anhydrin is a compound that would react again with a primary amine. So you have your uh, primary amine and then you have your different components and here's how the reaction goes. They're color-coded to follow where they go in the reaction. And then it's a chain of a reaction that end up with producing uh, compounds that will absorb light in the visible range at 50 570 nanometer. But specifically, proline and hydroxyproline, the color is yellow and absorption is at 440. So you will have to measure absorption at two different wavelengths to determine all amino acids. Another reaction is with a feldehyde, or for short, OPA. So again, it's a reaction with the primary amine. So here's your primary amine linked to either an entire protein or an amino acid, depending on what you have in your system. And the aldehyde will react with the primary amine, result in a fluorophore. That means a compound that fluoresces. So you measure the fluorescence. So absorption is measured at 380 and fluorescence is measured at 450 nanometer. And for the analysis, you will learn the difference between absorption and fluorescence 
and how they're measured. Um, but uh, this is another way of quantifying um, free amines or composition of amino acids. This is an important characteristic of uh, amino acids and hence proteins. They have the acid base characteristic. So they have acid base properties. So every amino acid has an isoelectric point or pH at which it has a zero net charge. And every amino acid has a pK1 and pK2. I'll talk about pKs in a minute. But at the isoelectric point, we call the ion or we call the this molecule zwitter ion. Although it carries charge, but they cancel each other. That's why it's a zwitter ion, because plus and minus cancel, so you have a net zero charge. So you have one plus, one minus, so you have a net zero charge. So if we titrate with base, look at the scale here. We're titrating with NOH, so that means we're increasing the pH. As we increase the pH, what happens, I told you the base likes to keep holding on to the proton. But if you're titrating with OH and you keep titrating, the base finally will give up and say, OK, here's my proton. So we'll give you the proton. And by giving up a plus, you end up with a net negative charge. So at high pH, you have a net negative charge. The opposite is true when you are titrating with acid. So you are titrating, you are giving the system H+. Plus. You're giving the system protons. So what happens is your carboxyl group will reluctantly, at some point, start taking these protons. When they pick up proton, then this becomes a positive charge, because this loses its negative charge, and this becomes positive. So as the pH goes down, you end up with net positive charge. As the pH goes up, you end up with negative charge. So at every point in time, you will reach an equilibrium. At every pH, you will reach an equilibrium. A certain amount of positive and a certain amount of negative or a certain amount of positive and a certain amount of neutral, certain amount of negative, and a certain amount of neutral. So you would end up at equilibrium, and we call that equilibrium constant, or dissociation constant. The concentration of dissociated ions at a particular pH when you reach equilibrium. So. One last thing, I will leave you with that, is pKa. pKa, or uh, pK1 in this case, let's talk about pK1, is the pH at which you have equal amount of charged and non-charged. So here, for pK1, it's equal amount of carboxyl groups to uh, the ones that are negatively charged to the ones that are protonated, equal concentration. pK2 or pKa2 is when you have equal concentration of charged plus or non-charged amine. So this is what I'm going to leave you with um, for now. We'll continue on Friday. Yeah, you can do that. I will tell her the names I remember.